Welcome to Chapter 2, Water, Part 4. In this part, we'll be looking at the ionization of water, weak acids, and weak bases. Water molecules have a slight tendency to undergo reversible ionization to yield an H plus ion or a proton and a hydroxide ion, giving this equilibrium. Although we commonly show the dissociation product of water as H+, free protons do not exist in solution. Hydrogen ions formed in water are immediately hydrated to form H3O+, or hydronium ions. Hydrogen bonding between water molecules make the hydration of dissociating protons virtually instantaneous, as shown here. There's hydrogen bonding among adjacent water molecules, and this leads to the formation of hydronium ions. And this process is very fast or instantaneous. Now, the reversible ionization is exploited in cellular processes. To understand the reversible equilibria, we use the equilibrium constant, K equilibrium. The ionization of water can be measured by its electrical conductivity. Pure water carries electrical current as hydronium ion migrates towards the negatively charged cathode and hydroxide ion towards the positively charged anode. The movement of hydronium and hydroxide ions in the electrical field is extremely fast compared with that of other ions such as Na plus, K plus, or Cl minus, right? This high ionic mobility results from the kind of proton hopping. As shown here in this figure, proton hopping is nothing but uh, a proton from a hydronium ion is taken up by the oxygen of the adjacent water molecule, and this chain continues uh, as shown from this hydronium ion to all the way to this water, right? Um, no individual proton moves very far through the bulk solution, right? It moves via this hydrogen bonded water molecules in what is called as a proton hopping phenomenon. So when it moves through this hydrogen bonded water molecule, protons can cover long distances in remarkably short time. Remember, hydroxide ions also moves rapidly by proton hopping, but in the opposite direction. As a result of this high ionic mobility of protons, acid-base reactions in aqueous solutions are exceptionally fast. So proton hopping also plays a role in biological proton transfer reactions. For example, in enzyme active sites where proton transfers happen, proton, happening, proton hopping is one of the phenomena. Proton hopping also happens in ion channels. So that is why proton hopping is important and that is exactly why uh, I introduced it here. Because reversible ionization is crucial to the role of water in cellular function, we must have a means of expressing the extent of ionization of water in quantitative terms. So let us see how this is done. Water can be uh, expressed in this form, right? H2O giving H plus plus OH minus. So the equilibrium constant can be written as uh, products, the concentration of products over reactants. In this case, concentration of proton and hydroxide ion over concentration of water. Now, the concentration of pure water at 25 degrees Celsius is 55.5 molar. So, by rearranging the equilibrium expression, we get this, right? You just plug in for uh, this expression. So, you take this to the left-hand side 
and plug in for the concentration of water at 25 degrees C. Electrical experiments show the equilibrium constant is 1.8 by 10 to the minus 16 molar. So again, plugging in this number for K equilibrium, you get this expression. And so, H plus, concentration of H plus times the concentration of hydroxide iron is equal to 1 by 10 to the minus 14. So, the product of concentration of H plus iron and the concentration of OH minus ions is equal to Kw or iron product. From the previous slide, we derived Kw as equal to 1 by 10 to the minus 14, right? By definition, since water overall is uncharged, the concentration of H plus ions is equal to the concentration of OH minus ions. And so solving for H plus, we get H plus ions is equal to the concentration of OH minus ions, which is equal to 1 by 10 to the minus 7. pH is just a measure of the concentration of H plus ions. So the question is, what is pH? pH is defined as the negative logarithm of the hydrogen ion concentration. So if you look at the ion product, which is equal to the, the product of concentration of H plus and OH minus ions, and which equals to 10 to the minus 14, you could actually convert these into pH terms. So you give negative log for these, negative log H plus, negative log OH minus is equal to 14, right? Because negative log of this becomes 14. Now, if you use this definition of pH, negative log H plus becomes pH, and negative log OH minus becomes pOH, right? So pH plus pOH is equal to the number 14. And pH and pOH must always add to 14. In neutral solution, concentration of H plus is equal to OH minus, and thus the pH is 7. pH can also be negative. Now, the value of 7 for pH of a precisely neutral solution is not an arbitrarily chosen figure. It is derived from the absolute value of the iron product of water at 25 degrees centigrade, which by convenient coincidence is a round number. Solutions having a pH greater than 7 are alkaline or basic. The concentration of o min OH minus is greater than that of H plus when the pH is greater than 7, as you can see here. Conversely, solutions having a pH less than 7 are acidic. Keep in mind that this pH scale that is shown here is logarithmic and not arithmetic. To say that two solutions differ in pH by 1, unit means that one solution has 10 times the H plus ion concentration as that of the other. But it does not tell us the absolute magnitude of the difference. pH of some common liquids are shown here. As you can see, soft drinks such as cola and other alcoholic beverages like red wine and beer are acidic. Black coffee is also acidic, and so is lemon juice, which is uh, commonly known to be acidic, right? Milk, human saliva, human blood, seawater, egg white, all these comes close to neutral pH, right? Whereas household bleach and household ammonia, which are toxic, are increasingly basic and have a high pH. Biological pH is close to 7.4. Strong acids such as hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, and nitric acid will completely dissociate in pure water, whereas weak acids will not completely ionize or dissociate. Ka, or acid dissociation constant, describes the tendency of an acid to deprotonate in water. 
Similar to strong acids, strong bases such as sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide will completely dissociate in pure water, whereas weak bases will not completely dissociate or ionize. Kb or base dissociation constant describes the tendency of a base to protonate in water. Let us see how Ka and Kb are perceived and described. Ka is often used as a standard even for basic molecules, but sometimes you'll see Kb. They are basically the two sides of the same coin. Now, if you consider the dissociation of an acid, now, usually, acid is represented as HA, and base is represented as B. The reason why acid is represented as HA is, is because it has protons to donate. Acids donate protons. Base accepts proton. So, when it dissociates, you have H plus plus A minus. So, you have Ka and Kb, right? Now, remember, Strong acids dissociate completely. Weak acids do not dissociate completely. Same way, bases. When you have a base taking, a, taking up a proton, uh, you consider the dissociation constant as Kb, right? B plus H plus gives BH plus. Now, the product of Ka and Kb gives Kw, or the ionic product of water. So pKa plus pKb will be equal to pKw. Let us consider the dissociation of a strong electrolyte like HCl. HCl dissociates into H plus and Cl minus. And the pKa of this dissociation is minus 7. So the Ka then becomes 10 to the 7 molar and it is equal to H plus concentrations times the Cl minus concentration divided by the concentration of HCl. Let us solve a problem. The question is, what is the final pH of a solution when 0.1 moles of hydrochloric acid is added to water to final volume of 1 liter? Now we know that dissociation of HCl to H plus and Cl minus is complete, right? So Ka in this case is x times x divided by 0.1 minus x. Why x and where does the x term come from, right? Because we know that Ka is equal to concentration of H plus times concentration of Cl minus divided by the concentration of HCl. We do not know the concentration of H+. Plus. That is the question. So we consider it as X. And because the dissociation is uh, complete, the concentration of H+, plus is equal to the concentration of Cl-. minus. So you assume Cl- minus concentration is also X. Right? Now, concentration of HCl in this case will be 0.1 minus X in the denominator. So you equal that to 10 to the 7 molar. 0.1, remember, is because the moles of HCl in this case. So you can rearrange this to a quadratic equation, right? You can say x squared equals 10 to the 6 minus 10 to the 7 x. And then you can rearrange this equation like this, in equate it to 0. And then you can find the solution for x, which would be 0 0.0999. I recommend you to do this and find the answer. The pH is thus equal to 1.0006. So how does x becomes this? Now remember, x is the concentration of H plus ion, right? So we are equa equating H plus is this minus log H plus would give you pH equal 1. Now, because HCl is a strong acid, we can actually do this problem using a simple methodology. We assume that the strong acid or base fully dissociates. So Ka values is greater than 1. Therefore, 
the concentration of HCl is equal to the concentration of H plus iron, right? Because HCl fully dissociates, all the H plus ions are coming from this and the concentration is equal to this. And so HCl is equal to H plus, which is equal to 0.1 molar because the concentration of H hydrochloric acid is already given. So the pH is minus log 0.1, which is one. Now remember, you can only do this assumption and simplification in case of a strong acid or a strong base. So what about the dissociation of weak electrolytes? Right? As a biochemist, I am more interested in the behavior of weak acids and weak bases, those which are not completely ionized when dissolved in water. Why? Because weak acids and weak bases are ubiquitous in biological systems and play important roles in metabolism and in regulation. The behavior of aqueous solutions of weak acids and bases is best understood if we first define some terms. Now, in this equation, acidic acid is the acid because it is the proton donor. And this is the proton that it donates, right? And when it is dissolved in water, it dissociates partially to CH3COO minus and H3O plus, right? And when it loses a proton, uh, water takes up a proton, becomes a hydronium ion. So this is a proton donor, and this can be considered as a conjugate base or a proton acceptor. So this is a conjugate acid-base pair, right? Now, in case of uh, weak electrolytes, the extent of dissociation is determined by, again, by acid dissociation constant, Ka, which is given by the concentration of uh, H plus ions times concentration of the conjugate base, which is the acetate ion, divided by the concentration of acetic acid. Now, for acetic acid, uh, the K equilibrium is known. It's an experimental value, and it is given as 1.74 times 10 to the minus 5 molar. We can calculate the pH if the K is known. In most cases, the K is known because it's an experimental value. But some algebra is definitely needed. So the concentration of protons in this case is equal to Ka times the concentration of acetic acid divided by the concentration of acetate or the conjugate base. Let us consider a problem. What is the final pH of a solution when 0.1 moles of acetic acid is added to water to a final volume of one liter? If you remember, this is very similar to the problem that we looked at for HCl. The only difference is that acetic acid is a weak electrolyte or weak acid and HCl is a strong acid. In this case, we assume that only source of H plus is the weak acid. Remember, you cannot use the simplified version like we did for HCl because acetic acid is a weak acid and the dissociation is only partial. To find the concentration of H plus, we use a similar strategy where we say X as the concentration for the conjugate base and X as the concentration for H3O plus. And then we plug into Ka equation uh, and we know the Ka is 1.74 times 10 to the minus five molar. And then we rearrange to get a quadratic equation which can then be solved for X to get a value of 0 0.001310, right? This is the concentration of H plus iron. And then if you uh, get the negative logarithm of this value, you get a pH of 2.883. This slide gives the pKa characteristics of weak acids. For example, monoprotic acids like acetic acid, ammonium iron, 
diprotic acids such as carbonic acids and glycine and triprotic acids such as phosphoric acids uh, are shown here. pKa is a constant value. Now, if we take the example of acetic acid, acetic acid has a pKa of 4.76. What does this mean? Right, this is the time when you do not confuse yourself. Right? You do not con confuse yourselves and make sure that you understand what the difference between pH and pKa is. By definition, pKa is the pH at which that molecule, or in this case acetic acid, gives up its protons. Right? pKa is usually given for a functional group. In this case, it's an it's a acid functional group, right? Now that's the only functional group that gives up or takes up proton. In the same way, if you consider glycine, glycine has two different functional groups. One is an amine and one is a carboxylate. Carboxylate has a pKa of 2.34, whereas an amine has a pKa of 9.60. This means that at pH of 2.34, glycine carboxylate gives up this proton and becomes COO minus. At a pH of 9.60, the NH3 plus in glycine gives up a proton and becomes NH2, right? There is no charge. This is the meaning of pKa. Now you can look at other molecules and um, you can see as to how pKa is defined for these. Make sure that you familiarize yourself and do not confuse between pKa and pH. This is very important. Titration is used to determine the amount of an acid in a given solution. In this case, for titration of an acidic acid, a measured volume of the acid is titrated with a strong base such as sodium hydroxide. When you increase the sodium hydroxide concentration, remember sodium hydroxide is added in small increments until the acid, which is acidic acid, is consumed as determined with an indicator such as phenolphthalein uh, or a pH meter in this case. As you increase the concentration of sodium hydroxide gradually more and more OH minus uh, ion increases and uh, free H plus in the solution is converted to H2O. Uh, the net result as a titration proceeds is that more and more acidic acid ionizes forming acetate ion as more sodium hydroxide is added. Now as you go through this process you reach a midpoint when half equivalence of NaOH is added per equivalent of acetic acid. One half of the original acetic acid at this point has undergoes dissociation so that the concentration of the proton donor that is acetic acid CH3COOH now equals that of the proton acceptor that is CH3COO minus. Uh, this is the point when the concentration of this becomes equal to this. At this point, a very important relationship holds. The pH of the equimolar solution of acetic acid and acetate is equal to the pKa of acetic acid, which is about 4.76. So that's what it is. pH is equal to pKa, that is equal to 4.76. The basis for this relationship which holds for all weak acids is what holds the buffering capacity of that specific molecule. Now, as the titration continues, as more and more sodium hydroxide uh, are added, the rest of the acidic acid molecule is converted to acetate. And at this point, all of acetic acid is converted to acetate. The end point of the titration occurs at about 
pH 7 in this case when all acetic acid has lost its uh, proton to hydroxide ions to form H2O and acetate. Now this figure compares the titration curves of three weak acids with very different ionization constants. Acetic acid in this case, phosphoric acid or dihydrogen phosphate, and ammonia. Although the titration curves of these acids have the same shape, they are displaced along the pH axis because the three acids have different strengths. Acetic acid with the highest Ka or the lowest pKa of the three is the strongest acid. Although they are all, although it is a weak acid, it is the strongest among these three. Now, you know that pKa um, has the half dissociation uh, limit at 4.76. This is where pH equal pKa. Dihydrogen phosphate loses a proton less readily being half dissociated at a pKa of 6.86. Ammonium iron is the weakest acid or the strongest base of the three and does not become half dissociated until a uh, pKa of 9.25. So the titration curve of a weak acid shows graphically that a weak acid and its anion or a conjugate base pair can act as buffer. The obvious question is, why is buffering necessary? Maintenance of intracellular pH is vital to all cells. Enzyme catalyzed reactions have optimal pH Solubility of polar molecules depends on hydrogen bond acceptors and donors. In gas exchange, the equilibrium between carbon dioxide gas and dissolved bicarbonate depends on pH. As you may know, our blood pH is buffered, right? And we have dissolved carbon dioxide in blood as bicarbonate. At the wrong pH, certain functional groups are no longer in the right ionization state to perform a specific role. We'll talk about this in the next chapter. Now, examples are enzyme catalysis, protein folding, etc. Many reactions will take place over a small pH range, but perform optimally at a set pH. Buffers are the key to moderating pH in your experiment as well as in your body. Buffer systems in vivo are mainly based on phosphate concentrations in the millimolar range, bicarbonate, important for blood plasma, histidine, efficient buffer at neutral pH as well. Buffer system in vitro are often based on sulfonic acids of cyclic amines such as heaps, pipes, chests, and sulfonic acid derivatives of these compounds are very useful buffers and are very good buffers because they have a range of pH that they can be used at. How does buffering work? If you recollect this titration curve for acetic acid, you'll notice that there is a relatively flat zone extending about one pH unit on either side of the midpoint where pH is equal to pKa of 4.76. In this zone, a given amount of H plus or H plus ions or acids or OH minus ion or base added to the system has much less effect on the pH than the same amount added outside the zone. This means that if you have a solution of acetic acid at a specific concentration that is maintained at pH 4.76 and then you try to add acid or base and try to change the pH, it will be difficult for you to change because the zone is relatively flat. 
you will have to add a lot of OH minus ions, a lot of H plus ions to change this pH. So that region is called as the buffering region. And hence, acetic acid is a good buffer between pH 4.5 and 5.5. And if you want a solution between 4.5, a uh, solution that buffers between 4.5 and 5.5, acetic acid is your choice because at 4.75, uh, acetic acid remains in solution as a combination of acetic acid and acetate. Right Now, again, to understand a little more, uh, let's look at this titration curve for these three. Right? Now, we already looked at acetic acid. If you look at phosphate, right? Phosphate, if you have a solution of phosphate, sodium phosphate or potassium phosphate or any other solution that is near pH 6.86. Remember, that's the pKa for uh, H2PO4, H3, H2PO4 minus to release a proton and HPO4 to minus. So this is the region where phosphate is really good buffer. So it can be really good buffer between pH of 5.5 and 7.5 if you try to add a uh, hydroxide ion or H plus ion it's extremely difficult to change the pH of the solution similar uh, to the ammonium ion right ammonium bicarbonate or ammonium acetate uh, because the ammonium ion has a pKa of 9.25 uh, this is a really good buffering region plus or minus one pH unit. The shape of the titration curve of any weak acid is described by the henderson hasselbalch equation, which is important for understanding buffer action and acid-base balance in the blood and tissue of vertebrates. Now, henderson hasselbalch equation for a weak acid can be derived as follows. We know that Ka is given by this expression and you can substitute for H plus ion concentration like this. Now when you take the negative logarithm on both sides, you get negative log H plus is equal to negative log Ka minus log HA over A minus. And converting that to the pH because negative log H plus is pH negative log Ka is pKa and you take the negative log of this you get just log so pH is equal to pKa plus log A minus over HA so it is conjugate base over the acid this is the famous henderson hasselbalch equation the henderson hasselbalch equation, as shown here, can also be derived for pOH. If you use Kb instead of Ka, you should be able to derive this equation. henderson hasselbalch equation allows us to calculate pKa, give one pH and the molar ratio of product, uh, proton donor and acceptor. Right, this is the proton donor and this is the acceptor. If you know the concentrations of these and pH, you should be able to calculate uh, pKa. You can also calculate pH if you know pKa and the concentration of the proton donor and acceptor. And also, you can also calculate the concentration, you can also calculate the molar ratio of uh, the proton acceptor and donor if you know pKa and the pH. In addition, the henderson hasselbalch equation should help you understand that deprotonation or protonation is a probabilistic event described by equilibrium constants. Water can act as a reactant as well. Water is not just the solvent in which the chemical reactions of living cells occur. It is very often a direct participant in those reactions. Water can be a often a product or reactant, like I said, in biological systems. Condensation reactions typically produce a water molecule as a side product. And in this case, water is a product. Hydrolysis reactions will use a water molecule as a reactant. 
and one of the most important hydrolysis reactions in biology is the breaking of a phosphoanhydride bond uh, to form ADP and a phosphate. And you learn a lot about ATP hydrolysis in detail as we uh, go along in this course. So let's summarize what we learned in this chapter. Right? In this chapter, we learned about the properties and structure of liquid water. We learned about hydrogen bonding and how hydrogen bonding affects the properties of water. Right? In addition, we learned about other intermolecular forces, which includes non-bonding interactions, including hydrogen bonding, hydrophobic interactions, ionic interactions, dipole interactions, Van der Waals interactions. After that, we learned about colligative and non-colligative properties of uh, various solutes, right, and how they affect the properties of solution. And to be specific, we looked at osmotic pressure and how osmotic pressure contributes to biological systems and what the effect of osmotic pressure on cells are. Following that, we looked at the behavior of weak acids and strong acids and bases in water. Specifically, as a biochemistry course, we are interested in weak acids, right? Weak acids and how weak acids dissociate. You know weak acids dissociate only partially, right? By now, you should have uh, made yourselves familiar with how weak acids dissociate and what is the arithmetic behind this. So you, you should be able to do the algebra uh, if asked a question, right? You, we also learned how weak acids can function as buffers, right? looked at the titration curves and we figured out as to how we can say that a specific weak acid is a buffer. One of the most important thing that I want you to take away from this uh, section or this part is about pKa. What is the relationship between pKa and pH? And that is dictated by a Henderson Hasselbalch equation for a weak acid or a weak base, right? And then how can you differentiate between pKa and P pH qualitatively as well, right? We, we are looking at a quantitative sense of differentiating pH and pKa. So this discussion will continue. pH and pKa will come back uh, in the next uh, chapter in much depth and also in following chapters. So I recommend you to understand this and familiarize yourselves with pH and pKa. Please write to me, contact me for any information uh, on these topics, all right? And I, you do have some problems um, that are in the next two slides if you are um, looking at the slides. So please make sure to attempt those problems.